Hello, Thayer. Today, you become one of those extraordinary individuals that we in the West Coast and Silicon Valley call a Dartmouth engineer. And that's a very good thing. Congratulations. I'm honored to be here today <clears throat> and to talk and have the privilege to talk to you about a few of my thoughts. Sometimes, you know, we as engineers get a bad rap. They say we don't have social skills. They say we're nerds. They say we like machines better than we like humans. Anyways, <laughs> all I have to say, all I have to say about that is I don't think that's true. It's not been my experience that that's the case. Right? But it does remind me of a little uh, story about the difference between an introverted engineer and an extroverted engineer. The introverted engineer, when they stand and talk to you, look down at their feet. An extroverted engineer, when he's talking to you, looks at your feet. <laughs> and, and there was an article recently in the, in the EE Times, Electrical Engineering Times, that, set, that was t entitled, Engineers Need More Social Skills. Engineers may need more social skills, but dot, dot, dot. This is a guy named Dave Tipansky, and he offers a convince, convincing defense against the argument against engineering uh, nerdiness. Uh, he says, ah, social skills. So engineers might not, must not only be able to perform differential calculus and build the tricoder from bear skins and stone knives, but must also be able to author the great American novel, attain a James Bond-like level of assurance at dinner parties, and negotiate peace between the Arabs and Israelis should the opportunity arise. <laughs> he, conti he continues, with rare exceptions, engineers and scientists know as much about social skills as the rest of the world knows about everything else. In other words, <laughs> everyone on the planet could, st st could stand to learn more and broaden their horizons. I think it's true. In order to be successful today, I really think that the, to, to be successful in the world, I think you really need to uh, choose to learn and be, have a wider perspective. Um, in preparing this speech today, I was thinking, I mean, what are the important things I could talk about? What's my you know, personal insights that I could uh, tell you about? And so like a good design thinker, I made a mind map. You know what that is? And I, um, and, but it, there was just too much on it. There was all these different things it could be. And so what I did was I made copies of my mind map <laughs> and I signed them and they're here for you. And so by getting this out of, I'll give this to you when we go back into the, to the, um, the studio. Um, by doing this, it gets me off the hook <laughs> and, and I can, you know, and, and it, I said, you know, in that I said things like, you know, um, if it doesn't feel good, don't do it, or enjoy every sandwich, you know, things that you would expect to hear in a commencement speech. <laughs> and, but this allowed me to focus on one thing, one thing that I'm really passionate about. And that's an important skill for engineers, and that skill is called empathy. To build great stuff today, we really have to collaborate with people, especially people that we want to use the things that we come up with. But it's a team sport. I believe engineering is a team sport now. And so having empathy for your colleagues as well is important, especially for non-techies. And we do have to figure out how to be able to work uh, and create with everybody around us. My experience has been that once you take an engineer and you turn them on, they use their big brains naturally and their know-how to come up and solve problems. They become totally engaged and totally energized. This is something, one of the reasons that I really like engineers. They have that way of naturally getting excited about things. When an engineer sees a problem, like when our um, warriors return home from war, or they, and they, they have certain problems, or they see a doctor 
who doesn't have the right tools, or even just kids who have trouble figuring out how to learn math in a new way. They immediately become energized and they use their big brains to solve the problem. They're just motivated to action, and I really think that's uh, important in an engineer. Though you might not know it, I think empathy is an engineer's greatest strength. And history provides lots of examples of that. Take, for instance, Dr. Edwin Land. Dr. Land invented, basically, uh, one-step photography the, and the Polaroid company. When he was uh, with, his ch with one of his children in Europe, the kid was about three years old, he said, honey, I'm going to take a picture of you. And, th and she became irritated because the picture, she didn't get a picture. You know, she said, where's the picture, daddy? And he, like, you know, as all fathers want to please their children, this motivated land. And he went back into the lab, and he was to create kind of one-step photography because of this uh, experience he had with his daughter. He developed a principle called diffusion transfer where you can, where the image uh, is on the, f the film and the, Im and the photo are the same image, I mean on the same plane, and this led to a big success. So during Land's lifetime it was a big success and for many years they sold billions of, of dollars worth of film. You, you don't know about Polaroid so much now but it was a huge, uh, had a huge impact in the world. Anyway, and this is a great, I think this is a great example of how uh, an innovation came about by an enge engineer being motivated by human need. All the best inventions that I know about coming out of Stanford and out of the D School and, and IDEO are really based on some understanding of who it is that uh, we're designing for. Take, for instance, HeartStream portable defibrillators. You know, these are the things that are in the airport, the red boxes that are on the wall. They're intended for someone who has never used one before to be able to save someone's life. You really only have about six minutes from the time someone has a heart attack till damage is really done, and so time is of the essence. So you're supposed to take the, pull this box down off the wall and help the person. So there's fantastic technology inside of them. But one of the real breakthroughs came from the engineers spending lots and lots of time testing them and being with the people who were not just the patients, but the people who were actually kind of walking by in the mall and what could they do, what, what, you know, being empathetic to what it, that they were capable of and how they, what their mental model was of how, how you could use this device. And so what happened is, I'll, I'll tell a quick story, but the was that the pads, the electrodes, can be placed, because the technology is so robust, the pads can be placed in lots of, lots of different places. And so that, we thought that would have, give the, the person lots of flexibility. But it turns out if you really hang with them and watch them use the device, that caused trouble, that slowed them down. So the innovation was that we kind of limited the technology. We said, put this, this pad, this left pad right here, and put this right pad right here. And although it, it seemed against the engineering uh, mindset, it resulted in a much faster throughput, right? So it's a great example of by hanging out how we got there. Or take the Embrace Infant Warmer. A bunch of Stanford students went to India and found that million, a million plus babies were dying because they couldn't maintain their birth weight. And so we got into designing incubators and the problem was that the incubators were in the hospital and that's not where the babies were. The babies were out in, in, in the villages. And so they ended up inventing something that looks more like a, a uh, sleeping bag with a paraffin liner that you can heat up. But the story there is that they would go out into the field and they just weren't working. You know, they, they couldn't understand why they weren't working. And so they, they had to get into the homes and really uh, try to understand the people that were you, the mothers that were using them. And what they found that the mothers in their culture, they had learned that Western medicine was so powerful that even though the, the instruction said warm this up to 98.6, they were only warming it up to 70 because of the power of Western medicine. So, in, so they had to change the thermometer from saying, you know, in degrees to not okay and okay. So you heat it up to the point that you get to okay. That happens to be 98.6. But um, it solved the problem, but they never would have gotten that if they hadn't built um, empathy for the people that they 
uh, we're trying to help. So um, empathy allows us to walk in each other's shoes. Excuse me. It's, it's super important when you're really trying to satisfy the people you're working on. So many schools have been slow to get started in teaching this kind of, uh, this point of view. And I think that makes a lot of people's education incomplete. Dartmouth and Thayer are ahead of the, are ahead of the uh, game because classes like Peter Roby's design thinking class and just the general attitude that design has value. But it's really important till we get to the point where we're designing with and for people and not with just with technology alone like we have been in the engineering field for a long time. I want you to encourage you to go out there and learn to look and listen harder and better. My brother and I, as Joe said, my brother and I wrote a book called Creative Confidence recently. And it's a, it talks about the natural creative ability that people have and their, and their kind of confidence to act on, the, on their ideas. And we find that with, this, with more empathy, with more of a human-centered approach, people are able to do that more easily. They're more motivated. And they become more effective in their lives, not only on the project that they're working on. So we believe that more than any technical skill that you can get as an engineer, empathy for others will allow you to gain that creative confidence and, and be able to innovate more routinely to accomplish what you set out to do. So I'll tell one more story, which is about a man named Doug Dietz. So Doug Dietz is a, a, a R&D professional at GE that makes uh, big um, MRI and CT scanners. And Doug um, was very proud of what he did because his machines were saving lives. And then he came to the D school and took a couple of courses and we kind of turned him on to this empathy work. And so he decided he really wanted to go out and understand people using his machines. So he went to a hospital and there was a family with a young child who was crying. And he asked what was going on. And he was told that the child was scared of the machine and that it turned out that 80% of the children that had to go through CT scans, had, they had to call the anesthesiologist right, to sedate them, to get through the machine. This crushed Doug. Right? He, he didn't have any idea this was going on. And so uh, he started to solve the problem. He used his design thinking techniques. He got everybody involved. He hired people to train uh, the staff. And in the end, he built um, a new kind of scanner called the Adventure Series, which is the old kind of scanner with stickers on it. <laughs> and, and those stickers make the scanner into a pirate ship or a spaceship. And then when the kids come in, he says, they say to them, you're going to go into the pirate ship. Can you be really quiet? You don't want to, you know, scare the pirates. And um, it changed. In this hospital, 80% of the kids now, 80% of the it used to be 80% of the kids needed to be um, anesthetized, and it went to 5%, right? All with changing the attitude, um, understanding what was, what was important to the kids, he was able to, to change that. And the ending of that story is really great where uh, he tells, he, every time he tells a story, he cries. But he tells the story of he's there later, you know, much later after the adventure series is in place, and a little girl runs up to her mother and says, Mommy, can we come back tomorrow? So when you leave campus and strike out on the world with your awesome, magical abilities to analyze, design, and build, and I really do think engineering skills are magical, don't just have the ambition to be a great engineer. Have the ambition to be a great human. Wear your empathy as a badge of honor. It will allow you to do your best work. And as a caring engineer, known today and forever, developing, for developing meaningful solution to today's most important challenges. Someone who has the confidence and the know-how to look someone in the eye and say, I understand what you need, and I think I can help. Thank you.